At what point in your career did you become connected with the Reese Committee? 1953. 1953. Yeah. And what was that capacity, sir? That was the capacity of what they call Director of Research for the Reese Committee. Can you tell us what the Reese Committee was attempting to do? Yes, I can tell you. It was operating and, and carrying out instructions embodied in a resolution passed by the House of Representatives, which was to investigate the activities of foundations as to whether or not these activities could justifiably be labeled un-American without, I might say, defining what they meant by un-American. That what we had uncovered was the determination of these large endowed foundations through their trustees to actually get control over the content of American education. Rowan Gaither was at that time president of the Ford Foundation. And um, uh, Mr. Gaither had sent for me when I found it convenient to be in New York. Mr. Gaither said, Mr. Dodd, we've asked you to come up here this today because we thought that possibly off the record you would tell us why the Congress is interested in the activities of foundations such as ourselves. Mr. Gaither then went on voluntarily and stated, he said, Mr. Dodd, all of us that have a hand in the making of policies here have had experience either with the OSS during the war or the European Economic Administration after the war. We've had experience operating under directives. We are here operate on similar, in response to similar directives, the substance of which is that we shall use our grant-making power so to alter life in the United States that it can be comfortably merged with the Soviet Union. Well, parenthetically, um, Mr. Griffin, I nearly fell off the chair. My response to Mr. Gaither then was, well, Mr. Gaither, I can now answer your first question. You forced the Congress of the United States to spend $150,000 to find out what you just told me. I said, of course, legally, you're entitled to um, make grants for, the, for this purpose. But I don't think you're entitled to withhold that information from the people of the country to whom you're indebted for your tax exemption. So why don't you tell the people of the country that's what you told me? And his answer was, we would not think of doing any such thing. So then I said, well, Mr. Gaither, obviously, you forced the Congress to spend this money. Dr. Johnson, who was then president of the Carnegie Endowment, telephoned me and said, did I ever come up to New York? And I said, yes, I did, more or less each weekend. And he said, well, when you're next here, will you drop in and see us? which I did. And Dr. Johnson said, after, again, amenities, Mr. Dodd, we have your letter. We can answer all those questions, but it'd be a great deal of trouble. And we have a counter suggestion, is that if you can spare a member of your staff for two weeks and send that member up to New York, we will give to that member a room in the library and the minute books of this foundation since its inception. And we think that whatever you want to find out or the Congress wants to find out will be obvious from those minutes. Well, my first reaction was they'd lost their mind. I had a pretty good idea of what those minutes would contain. But I realized that Dr. Johnson had only been in office two years and uh, the other, the, the vice presidents were relatively young men, and counsel seemed to be also a young man, and I guessed that probably they'd never read the minutes themselves. 
And so I said I had somebody, I would accept their offer. And I uh, went back to Washington and I selected the member of my staff who was on my staff, having been a, a practicing attorney in Washington, but she was on my staff to pre see to it that I didn't break any congressional procedures or rules. In addition to which, she was unsympathetic to the purpose of the investigation. She was a um, level-headed and a very reasonably brilliant, capable lady. And her attitude of, toward the investigation was, what could possibly be wrong with foundations? They do so much good. Well, in the face of that sincere conviction of Catherine's, I went out of my way not to prejudice her in any way. And off she went to New York. She came back at the end of two weeks with the following in the way of on, on dictaphone belts. We are now at the year 1908, which was the year that the Carnegie began operations. And in that year, the trustees meeting for the first time raise a specific question, which they discuss throughout the balance of the year in a very learned fashion. And the question is, is there any means known more effective than war, assuming you wish to alter the life of an entire people? And they conclude that no, no, no more effective means than war to that end is known to humanity. So then, in 1909, they raised the second question and discuss it, namely, how do we involve the United States in a war? Then finally, they answer that question as follows. We must control the State Department. And, the, and then that very naturally raises the question of how do we do that? And um, they answer it by saying, we must take over and control the diplomatic machinery of this country. And finally, they resolve to aim at that as an objective. Then time passes, and we are eventually in a war, which would have been World War I. And at that time, they record on their minutes a shocking report in which they dispatched to President Wilson a telegram cautioning him to see that the war does not end too quickly. And finally, of course, we are, <clears throat> the war is over. At that time, their interest shifts over to preventing what they call a reversion of life in the United States to what it was prior to 1914. At that point, they come to the conclusion that to prevent a reversion, we must control education in the United States. Yeah, I might tell you this experience as far as its impact on Catherine Casey is concerned was she never was able to return to her law practice. If it hadn't been for Carol Reese's ability to tuck her away in a job with the Federal Trade Commission, I don't know what would have happened to Catherine, but ultimately she lost her mind as a result of it.